So I'm hoping that during the course of the next half hour, I can enlighten you to what happens within pulmonary rehab. And so the statement here says it's exercise, it's education. A physiotherapist and a nurse will deliver the service and often the classes run two days per week and they're for patients with COPD. There are a few classes with other patients who don't have COPD, but can I ask, are most of you from primary care? Do you have the opportunity to refer into pulmonary rehab services? Any of you from Glasgow and Clyde? Okay, so this will be your service that I'm talking about. I hope it's not too different from other areas, but I'm happy to help where I can about other areas as well. So, rehab. If you send a patient to pulmonary rehab, they will have 20 hours of contact, patient-centred with a physiotherapist and nurse to help them living with their lung condition. So my aim today is to cover a bit about COPD, referral to rehab, assessment and reassessment that goes on within our services and discharge and what patients can look forward to afterwards. I'm going to mention one or two other classes and a few bits about statistics. So I'm not going to try and teach you anything new in this slide about COPD. You all know it's patients that would have a degree of chronic bronchitis, emphysema, a bit of both, more of one, less of another, okay? And this is what we are hoping that the patients will then understand a bit more about their disease as well. But some other facts. There are 120,000 people in Scotland with COPD. We're expecting a 33% increase in the next 20 years. Think of your patients in your practice. How many years have you seen the same patient that has got COPD? They live with this condition for years and years. It's the most common cause of presentation in ho uh, at the hospital door. In Glasgow, 46,000 plus bed days in GG and C are taken up by patients with COPD. And that occup occupancy rate is increasing as well. Recently, there's been some new research to say that with the patients with COPD, it is now the norm for them to have multi-morbidity, and you will know that with your management of them. And what has also become aware is that they have mental as well as physical complaints that go with the condition. I've taken this slide that is available in Glasgow. The reverse of it tells you all about asthma and your patient management. So within pulmonary rehab, we're hoping that our patients are on the optimum level of inhalers appropriate for the patient. And if they're not on the optimum level, we'd come back and discuss with you whether we could change that. This slide here shows you the pathway for patients that are coming to pulmonary rehab. If you look at the end here, it says GP referral and acute referral. These sizes don't reflect where we get the, uh, the patients from. These sizes reflect the boxes underneath so that we can describe what happens and where the referral pathway. Are we familiar with Sky Gateway referral? Okay, it's now an electronic re uh, referral to ourselves. We might get referral from secondary care. So if the patient has been in the wards and a respiratory nurse sees them in the wards, they can be, be referred to us or it might be at clinic. And some of our referrals still come in the old paper version as well. Okay, so after the patient's been referred, they will then have assessment six weeks of classes and finally a reassessment. 
So a bit more detail is the Sky Gateway referrals. You can expect your patient to be sent a letter of invite to come and book an appointment with us. That would be at their local hospital. The appointment for their assessment has to take place in the morning and that's because all their class times take place in the afternoon. So the staff are only available in the morning to do the assessment. If your patients receive two letters and don't reply, then you'll get a letter back saying that they've failed to respond to the invite letter. And there are some inclusion and exclusion criteria. And one of the main exclusion criteria is if a patient's completed pulmonary rehab, we don't want them to be referred into the service again. Hopefully they don't need our input and at that point they can actually go to vitality, exercise classes and continue on there and they don't need nurse and physio input when they've graduated from rehab. Some of you might remember referral to pulmonary rehab used to be based on FEV1. And if two patients had FEV1 of 50%, one would really need the service and one would still be at work and out and about and still able to do things. So FEV1 didn't reflect well the patients. Instead, we've moved on to look at MRC. And with MRC, what we're actually looking at is the impact for the patient on their mobility. So if a patient is grade one or two, they're out and about, they're still at the golf course, they're still working, they don't need referred into pulmonary rehab. When a patient gets to three, they're starting to notice that breathlessness and degrees of breathlessness are having an impact on their lifestyle. And that's when we want to look at referral. Referring patients isn't just about MRC, and if we think of patient symptoms that they might have, these are the reasons that we want patients referred into pulmonary rehab. If they have breathlessness that they're not able to manage, cough, excessive phlegm, wheeze, fatigue, feeling anxious, feeling down, and many of our patients are quite isolated. Socially, they don't have people to go out and meet. They don't have the mobility to get out to places. And sometimes we can turn that around and get them to rehab and increase their confidence so that they can go out and get to places again. Some more detail about the assessment and reassessment. We spend an hour with the patient subjective questions about their disease, their understanding of their disease, their medications and how they take them. Along with yourselves, we check inhaler technique, which probably can't be done too often with this patient group. Objectively, we do walk tests, either six minute walk test, which gives the patient the option to stop during the test but for some patients, they're more active, they don't need that, and they will do a more challenging incremental test that gets progressively faster. Both of these tests are designed to find out what happens when that patient's walking. Do they curtail themselves and stop at a slight hint of breathlessness? Do they push too much with breathlessness? or to find out if their breathing patterns affected at all within it. We also use two questionnaires. CAT questionnaire, are you all familiar with that? The chronic um, assessment test um, for patients with COPD and it's eight questions that ask about their symptoms and the score goes from nothing to 40. And if patients are scoring between 30 and 40, then there's a very high impact of their lung disease on them. For other patients, they might underscore it and not be truly reflecting how they are. 
So we can use that to focus um, how we're going to work with them. And the GADS2 and PHQ2, you're probably not familiar with, but do you remember the HADS questionnaire that we were allowed to use until there was a cost implication of every time we used it? So what we have instead is our own two question on anxiety, two question on uh, depression. Within rehab, we have a clinical psychologist and based on the answers to these two questions and some other questions as well, we can refer to clinical psychology if that's what the individual needs. So following their attendance at rehab, we would do reassessment repeat the bottom parts there and send you a discharge letter with details of how the patient has improved, not changed, maybe declined during the time that they've been with us. So if they've had several exacerbations and we've extended their exercise period, they might actually not be able to walk as far by the time they've finished the programme but they might know how to manage things and learn about pacing and such like within the programme. Although we do aim to have improvement with most of the patients, it doesn't always come out in the objective scores. So, breathing control score. This is what we use to help the patients understand a wee bit more about feeling breathless it's a score from 0 to 10, and the scores between nothing and 3 suggest that a person is in control of their breathing. Now, when the patients come in for assessment, we will be asking them, how did they manage to walk on the way from the outside of the hospital to get in for the appointment? And if they've had to stop several times, that gives us an indicator of breathlessness and what they're feeling. We will tell them that the more they walk, the more breathless they're likely to get, but we would be aiming for them just to get to a score of three, which is the limit of being in control. If they've walked further or faster, that score will then go up, and somewhat severe, severe is the patient being distressed. And the thought that springs to mind for them at that point is, I wish I hadn't done this. And time and again, they walk and have that perception of breathlessness. For some patients, the score goes even higher and they might find themselves very severely breathless. And that's where anxiety and breathlessness start to feed into each other and each one making the other worse. And when they get to maximal score at the top, that is them out of control. And we would ask if they would be panicking at that point in time. And often for our patients, they are doing that day in and day out. Others will recount to you, I've done it once, never again, that whole experience. And at that level of 10 with their breathing, they often say, I don't know where the next breath's going to come from. So our aim within class is to work on their degrees of breathlessness and teach them how to manage it. So we would say to the patients that getting distressed is normal, but getting to the distressed point, that getting to distress is not normal. Take that back. Getting breathlessness, getting breathless is normal. Getting distressed is not. And they have to learn not to end up bent over in positions like this. But they know when they climb the stairs at home that they're going to end up bent over and gasping and struggling. Okay? Patients have got a pair of lungs, they've got a pair of legs, and what happens? They forget themselves, they hurry, the legs go hurrying away, the lungs get left behind, and that's them gasping, distressed. 
So what we're aiming to do is to slow that pace down, to walk at the right speed that's right for their lungs so that they can feel better in every stretch of walk that they have to do. Showing you what happens to patients during activity, even minimal exertion can cause them anxiety, panic, to the point that they avoid wanting to do any walking and then they become unfit. And when they come into rehab, we're looking to break into all these parts and make a change. So we're hoping to get them more conditioned that they're able to exercise and able to exercise so that they have the confidence rather than distress that they might have started out with. <coughs> Pulmonary rehab involves exercise, but we can't say that to the patients if we're going to send them into a class. We have to disguise the fact that it's exercise, but Rehab comes with a guarantee for the patients that they're going to look like that at the end of the program. We focus on them exercising with upper limb, working on two different exercises. We focus on some work on the lower limb and we're looking to do a pro progressive exercise program over the 12 sessions and the six weeks that they come to us. Through the programme, the table here over six weeks shows you that in our service we have a physio, a nurse and a coach, an exercise instructor. And our benefits of that are that towards the end of the programme, the patients work less with the physio and more with the instructor. And it's the same instructor that's going to take their continuation programme. So that gets the motivation up for patients to continue exercising even after they've been in a hospital class. But exercise means something different to every person. But we have to find for our patients what's best for them so that they can fulfil whichever activity levels they can increase to. Alongside the education, we're, um, the exercise, we're also doing health education. These topics are covered by the nurse and physio, and I'm not going to read them all out. But you can see that there's quite a spectrum of aspects with COPD patients that we can cover and help them with. We expect most of our COPD patients to be referred in to us by yourselves in primary care. Other patients that benefit from rehab are those with bronchiectasis or interstitial lung disease. And the patients with interstitial lung disease I'd expect to be referred from secondary care because the staff there have seen the patients already. So, the patients with IPF, there's about a two and a half thousand of them in Scotland. The disease is very different from COPD. The life expectancy for these patients is very different. The whole rate of change is different. And whilst COPD will affect the muscles, and that's why we're exercising the COPDs, Exercise is beneficial for the IPF patients as well because of the breathing control that they need to adopt just for doing activities day in and day out. So we expect the referral to come from secondary care and at present in Glasgow we have a specific class in Queen Elizabeth that is open to all our patients across GG and C who have ILD. Some patients will take up the opportunity to travel to Queen Elizabeth and be able to do that, whilst others 
the journey will be too much and instead of going to the class specific for ILD, they can go to their local pulmonary rehab. The education has to be tweaked for them, but they still get the opportunity for that as well. So at the moment, what we're doing is one class per week, one and a half hours, half hour education and one hour of exercise. And this is a quote from one of the patients that had completed rehab. And I think it lets you realise that rehab is all-encompassing. There's so much there in offered for patients within it. We have another programme, and it's a research programme, looking at patients with adult uh, asthma patients who have uncontrolled asthma. These are a very severe patient group. They are not the group that you at present would be managing by yourself. These are the patients that are being managed in secondary care. And what we're looking at is whether we can offer a rehab programme for patients that have very severe asthma. Because of the client group in it, we're basing it in the hospital. And in the past year, we've had no specific problems with the patients that have come in. And we've had one patient had to use a nebulizer midway through the class. Other than that, it's been complete normal management. But I think that reflects what we've heard today about if you get asthma, at the, you have asthma, but at a certain point in time, you are normal, you have no acute attacks and no symptoms, then we're looking to see if we can exercise these patients to a higher level. The words here that don't really show up in the side here are SPRAG, the Scottish Pulmonary Rehab Action Group. And it's a group of physios and nurses from all the health boards in Scotland who meet annually and have done work to try and promote pulmonary rehab locally in their own areas. But based on an audit done two years ago, it highlighted the fact that there were 69,000 people who were eligible and met the criteria for pulmonary rehab. But at present, our classes across all of Scotland only had capacity for 9,000. So there is an unmet need of patients with COPD who are not getting the opportunity to get in and get rehab. Hopefully today, by raising awareness with yourself as staff that see patients that are eligible, you will be able to refer more patients in. To show you a few figures from Glasgow, down the referrals down this side show that the secondary care referrals are greater than the primary care and the total is nearly 2,500 in 2017. If I look back a year or two, the referrals from primary care were greater than secondary care and they appear to have gone down with recent changes in primary care. So I think we still have our same patients there. So I'm appealing to you to refer more of your patients if you managed to in the past. Hopefully you can again. The figures on the other side show that of the patients that attended in 2017, there was 879 successfully completed the rehab programme. Of those in the unsuccessful category, most of them were due to an exacerbation of COPD and difficulty with getting to the class. We also have a very large number that get referred to us. And as I said earlier, we send two invite letters and we get no patient response. So 
So, why is pulmonary rehab most effective? Because their patients can walk further, because their breathing control is improved. If they need oxygen, then we will be supplying and educating them with oxygen. And the CAT score will show, and the GADS questionnaire will show changes with them as well. You might wonder why I didn't put up evidence after evidence for all the aspects of pulmonary rehab, because I found this slide to use instead. And it's highlighted that pulmonary rehab compared to conventional care in COPD, we don't need to compare it anymore. We know the benefits are there and they exist. And all we have to do now is tweak around the edges for other population. And to finish up, to say that breathing, pacing and having these under control combined with working in the upper limb, working in the lower limb, adding it together, doing walking. The outcomes are that patients are able to be more active. They might be able to go and visit people that they couldn't before. I've said to patients they might be able to go shopping, but maybe that didn't go down well for some of the population. But rehab encompasses all of that. Living with COPD, is a roller coaster. Sometimes you're on the up and you're feeling better. Another chest infection, you might recover. From the first infection, you might get a second. But for our patients, we're teaching them to live with COPD. Thank you. I've got one, which is a bit dear to my heart at the moment. And that is, you know, we may not be too good at referring, but the patients aren't too good at attending and sticking with it. How do we get into that cycle of our making a referral? They may or may not attend even once. Um, I think it's about the impact that COPD is having on that person. So if your person says they are getting breathless doing, pulmonary rehab has that answer. Um, or if they want to know more about their lung condition or their inhalers. So the idea is to sell pulmonary rehab based on the patient's own perception of their condition. Right, so tailored selling. Yes. Marketing a, even. Yeah, I skipped skip okay, that slide. So those of you who are seeing COPD patients, some of you are nurses doing reviews, GPs, specialist nurses, how do you sell the patients so that they actually get to Elaine? Uh, for me it's about establishing their interest in exercise before they were diagnosed with COPD in their life. You know, were they into exercise? Did they, did they like going to the shops shopping? Did they like going to the supermarket? Were they, how, how active were they beforehand? Before yes, I'll yes. ascertain what's the likelihood of them taking this up and in, really engaging with it. I'm not saying that I wouldn't refer them if they didn't, but I think that often indicates, and, and having an honest conversation with them, what's the chance of you actually engaging with this if I offered it to you? Mm -hmm. And there are some patients that they've stopped their job, they don't go out anymore, and the men say, I don't have anywhere to go. And then he one man come back in and said it was uh, his wife had commented he now had something to talk about. And that social isolation that goes with it. Thank you. Um, a significant barrier where I am, we're, we're very rural and uh, you've got a 30, 40 mile journey potentially to get people to, to, to rehab. Have you any experience of, of this being done remotely using telehealth links, videos, anything like that? Yep. Uh, remote rehab has been done in various parts of Scotland uh, around Perth. And uh, so you would have your hub in the hospital there with a remote site and a video link. So the patients would be 30 miles apart, but they could speak to each other. And Phyllis Murphy has done it down in Dumfries as well, between Dumfries and Stranraer. 
So we're not asking patients to make the extended journey to try and do it like that. I'm not sure if the programmes are still running, but there certainly are, have been some models of that that have worked. I think it's the word exercise myself. Somebody yeah. invited me to do some exercise. Uh -huh. oh. I think I'd probably, I was going to say run a mile, that's obviously not the appropriate thing to say, <laughs> but I would certainly probably look the other way. Uh -huh. Now, if you said, would I like to do something active and interesting? That's it. No exercise yeah. is allowed to be mentioned by the GPs or Word. practice nurses when they link it with pulmonary rehab. Uh -huh. They've, in Glasgow, they don't put the two together. Thanks for that, I mean, when I, I think you're just missing a wee trick there, Ray. I don't think you shared the fact that next week is a National Pool and Rehab Week in the UK and globally as well. So if you can go on to Twitter and social media, there's yes. lots going on, there's lots of interesting facts about it as well. So next week, keep your eyes peeled for National Pool and Rehab Week. Thank you. Thank you. The reason it's of interest to me is that one of the trials that I'm involved in, it's actually running in London and, and the Midlands, we are actually looking at supporting people with anxiety and depression with some CBT-like management in order to get them from yeah. the point of referral through to the, at least the first few sessions. Uh -huh. um, yes. We don't know whether it will work yet. It's too early to tell, but we are busy recruiting.